believe by asking consciously, where am I, where do I want to go? You know, and recognizing in the beginning, when I am at a younger age, I might go for something what other people wanted me to go to, whatever parents, whatever uh, society, or whatever community gives value, that is where we may pay attention in the beginning. But as we become comfortable with the new role, comfortable with the new job, we begin to develop some of our own awareness. As we develop awareness of who we are, it is like our personality begins to blossom, where you begin to recognize part of me is conditioned by my family, by my religion, by my society, by my education, by my peers. But part of me is immutable. And that part of being, that actually is the ground of who you are, you know, to a certain extent, that is what you call true being. Sometimes, I call that, as, as in, a, in a funny way, wherever you go, you keep manifesting that being. Only thing is, everybody else sees that unique being. Only you are the one who is invisible to that particular awareness. That's what I call, prasad keeps on prasading. Whether I am in a one-on-one -on -one coaching, whether I am in a classroom, whether I am actually with a coachee or whether I am with my family, there is a unique way I relate to each other. If that unique way of relating you know, has emotional intelligence, Chances are I will have a lot more people around me when I need them. And when there is something wonderful going on in their life, they will invite me as well. And if there is no EQ, then there will be less number of people to invite. But the key part is wherever I go, the unique nature of who I am, my signature strength, or you might call it my brand. Actually, that is the one when everything else is same. Like especially in this crisis times, you know, some, some of you will be looking for jobs. Several of you might apply for the same job, even if there are limited number, you will see, okay, all of us are about the same age group, all of us have similar background, all of us have got similar interests. Now, how do you differentiate yourself? At that time, you are true not. Something that you engage, not because somebody gives you money, not because in order to reach that goal, not because something else that something inherently gives you joy. When you speak about that, you will come alive. When you bring your uniqueness to come alive in your interview, your chances go up significantly. Whether it's an MBA interview, whether it's a job interview, if you can discover that unique passion, that unique energy trigger, that unique magic that makes you come alive, if you can begin to bring it into conversations with people, not only you will be energized, you will inspire other people around you. Just like we talked about a person who is very critical, nobody wants to have them on their, uh, on their team, even though they are very smart, because they always keep pointing out negative things, people become uncomfortable having them. Just like that, people who bring out who they are authentically, so when they bridge their being doing gap, if you want to call through courage of conviction, courage of vulnerability, courage of authenticity, courage of truth telling, courage of caring, if these are some of the things which you are doing, you will notice your goals may shift, but what is underneath that doesn't shift. That means you are on a journey, you know, like as we said, the journey doesn't go like this, it goes like this. So there are lots of stops which you stop in. Some of the stops are the jobs you stay for 10 years, some of the things which you stay in a relationship for 3 years, they may be the way stations. But till you get there, you will never know whether that is your end destination or that is just a way station. If you can learn to be fully engaged with them, with a sense of gratefulness, with a sense of appreciation, to the extent you can take whatever job you get, whatever work you are doing, whatever course you are doing, whatever role and group you work with, if you can bring more service, more joy, meet their needs and figure out a way to learn from that scenario, your recommendations will carry you through even in a very difficult scenario. Why? 
people like to have you. You may not have the technical expertise, you may not have the exact needs, but they will create jobs just to have you because you are the person, you will not only demonstrate competence and capability, you will also inspire other people to get to a higher level of standard. Taking it aside, when you are in one of those way stations, you begin to recognize that I am moving towards you, but these are some things I need to drop off. At this journey, you know, just like a, what you call igniting something, if you ignite a rocket, as it goes from here to the moon, it drops off first the first part of the, what you call fuel container, which is the one which got it out of the atmospheric uh, plane. Then it drops off the second one. Then you have a small portion that actually goes and reaches the target. Similarly, our true north begins to shed various layers which are superficial, which are given by other people, which we picked up from our parents, which we picked up. You know, by the way, how we pick up from parents? We pick up based on their aspirations and needs and also we pick up by their negative feedback to us. So if we don't like our parents, we say, I don't ever want to be like my parents. Or if we like our parents, we want to be exactly like our parents. Both don't have any choice. We have a lot of work to do to unlearn both of those to discover who we are. You know, very interesting journey. Actually, this part, this is called finding your voice. This chakra, in Indian context, in Kundalini, they call it Visuddha. Why? It purifies influence of the society and everybody else to bring out your true self. That is why it is called finding your own voice. This is the part here. But before you discover your own voice that will help you to guide towards your true not, you have to go through the path of the heart, which is again the emotional center. What is the meaning of a path of a heart? This one, if I use the same Kundalini, it is called Anahata Chakra. The chakra of unstruck sound. That means the sound does not come by positive, negative, right and wrong, good and bad. It actually comes by a certain attachment, certain love. Love is the primary center. That means what you love, what you appreciate, what you care for, what you are looking forward to, that is the one that grows you and moves you towards your prana. So, coming back to your question, if I can identify wherever I am, is there more joy, is there more learning, is there more contribution, is there more a sense of meeting my needs. You know, these four are not random. Need is at the body level. Okay. Service is at the heart level. The skills are at the head level. The joy is at the happiness or a spirit level. Each, this is like a Maslowian hierarchy. This is also a hierarchy of meeting your needs at different levels. As you evolve, you begin to notice your score from 0 to 10, not only on the right hand side or left hand side, but also on the right hand side, you begin to notice that overall score keeps going up. Out of 80, you know, in case you got more than 80 points, there is some scoring error which you need to look at. Because each of them are four, there are four things on two sides. You will notice your scores begin to get higher and higher. Instead of five out of zero to ten, you may get eights and nines and tens. Not only on one side, actually on the other side. What it means is, as the scores become higher and higher, you will notice there is no place to go to. It's actually a place to come from. Trunar ultimately is not a destination. It's actually a state of the mind. Because if I can come from a state of certain amount of being oneself, being authentic to what is my strength, where am I? And if I can come from that sense of satisfaction, a sense of being in one's own center, that centered place, the definitions and the decisions and desti destinations and the journey, it may go up and down, but you will be able to see it from a balanced perspective.
so you will be able to recognize when the great things happen you don't get overjoyed and lose your balance if worse things happen you don't lose it let me take an example like right now if you notice with the Taj and the Oberai things happening we all are affected by it if you notice because of the 36 hours television show, live show, many of us are emotionally connected and affected. There is fear in the room, there is fear in the nation, there is fear that allows us to bring out the, you know, like, oh, we need to go bomb them, we need to send bangles to our politicians. I know, we are scared. But think about it. In the time when we are most afraid, the terrorism brings out terror in us. It actually makes us terrorists. We become impatient. We begin to snap at people. We become afraid. Actually, we create a very difficult and unbearable surroundings all around us. Why? Our mind has downshifted to a place where cortisol, adrenaline are flowing so freely in the cerebellum or the medulla oblongata, in the whole spinal cord and in the lower brain we are actually operating from this autopilot so much, all the blood is going to extremities and protecting your stomach, that there is nothing left for brain to think. You know, you know that much of the brain, actually the blood flow and much of the oxygen goes to the brain. But when you are in fearful state, have you noticed words become stuttering? It is hard to talk. It is hard to coherently form sentences. We begin to just get gripped by a certain rage. In that particular stage, the victim becomes a perpetrator. Have you ever noticed in psychological sense, many of us who are victims of some damage, we continue to perpetuate it. That's what happens when we become most afraid. And what I'm suggesting is, there is a way to upshift from there. A state in which you can upshift is not into an autopilot, but from a state of emotional balance because the heart has to become a quiet container in which the mind can reflect the clarity of your thinking. Your clarity of thinking comes when your heart is quiet, when you are balanced, when you are centered. Then the kind of decisions you make become much more balanced. And next step would be to think clearly and actually how you do that is aspiration. Have a high aspiration, not because it gets you towards your true not, but because that challenges you, that stretches you. Because nobody else in this room or anywhere else knows your true potential. You have some inkling. You know that you can stretch much farther than any goal other people give you to. Isn't it true? You have a genius that is not fully ignited. But nobody can ignite that genius. You have to find a way to ignite it. How do you do that? Create aspirations, especially noble aspirations, not because they are your true not, but because this will be fun to play with. There will be something that it will be wonderful if you can achieve, not only for you, but for everybody else. You know, like somebody says, the reason why caterpillars have to become butterflies is not because it is a fulfillment of its higher self, but because without that there will be no spring. The flowers, the cross-pollination and bringing of spring into the universe happens by the butterflies which are actually carrying pollen from one to another. So to a certain extent, we stretching ourselves, we challenging ourselves is not necessarily about us. It's also about a contribution we alone can make. When we discover our true self, true, when we are in touch with our authentic true not, when we are moving by stretching, by going to a place where we would not go by ourselves, by creating a high aspiration, whether you want to be an entrepreneur, whether you want to be a social entrepreneur, whether you want to be a politician, whether you want to be a CEO of a company, if you can begin to see what can I do to the best of my ability and I am unwilling to stop just because somebody said that's all you can reach. If you can believe in yourself, if you can truly begin to challenge yourself and figure out different ways in which you can move towards your goal, 
then it is not only you will be reaching your goal, all of us will be getting much more fulfilled. Because there is pride in some of the ISBNs reaching their goals. But the th next one is, when you reach certain place, you begin to notice what were the touch points, what were the transformations. Through desperation or aspiration, we can bring change. But in autopilot, which is 90% of the time, we don't bring change. Only thing is, through desperation, we can only bring certain amount of change. But through aspiration, we can bring a significant amount of conscious change. That is in our hands. If we can work towards it, our true north will not only help us, but actually will help everybody around us to get to a higher place. Then, you are igniting your leadership genius. It is no longer about you being a leader, everybody else being a follower. People get inspired by your leadership that other people want to go to places that they are not courageous to do it themselves. They become inspired, you become a role model and through that we create a field, Chetra, we create a field of global leaders. Yeah? Any comments or questions? Excuse me. So motivation is an important component for aspiration. Right. So how do you connect this together? Because your right to your motivation only gives, gives you a right set of aspiration. So what's your take on that? What do you take? So the question is, how do you connect motivation with aspiration? I find there are six steps to it. One is, first step is recognizing my motivation generally comes from self-interest when I am not thinking really big. So self-interest, what makes me pleasurable, what makes me happy, what kind of food I want to eat, what kind of money I want to earn, what kind of job I want to do, what kind of place I want to live. These come from the past, what other people have told us, that is the first level. So our sukham, our enjoyment, our sense of happiness, our sense of motivation depends upon external factors which are easily achieved. If we don't get them, or if we do get them but we are not happy, second step requires perseverance and a patience to get the next level of uh, motivation. Those are not easy. They will challenge you. They will expect you to be more than somebody else. Like something, you know, like a talk like this, I think I mentioned it a while ago or before also, 10% of the people will benefit a lot from this talk because they will take it, apply it and actually make it their own. Out of them, 3% will reach goals they never imagined that they could reach. Why? Because they are not only motivated to take it, they actually apply it wherever and whenever they can and their mindset changes towards reaching that goal. It is not that other 90% don't. They may be inspired, they may be excited or they might have gotten some answers but the motivation is not allowing them to persevere with the path that they have chosen and stay with it till they reach the goal. Okay, that is second level. Once you have the ability to persevere in the face of difficulty to move towards your goal just because you say so or because you aspire it, the next step it comes down to is decision making. When do you say enough is enough? Or when do you say I have other things in my life I want to achieve? I can't just hold on to this. When do I look at balance? What is it that I need? That is where you need a discrimination to see is this something I should continue to stay motivated or is this time to say, you know, it is no longer relevant for me. Okay. The next step after that, by the way, I will give you examples for some of this. Uh, once I do six so that it becomes clearer. The next step it becomes is, what is the role I want to play in making myself reach this goal? What is the, because at that time motivation is no longer about do I do it or not do it. You begin to do it and say, what do I want to prove out of being there? What role I want at the end of it? Oh, you start an entrepreneurship uh, or you create a project and it turns into a company. Do you want to be a CEO? Do you want to be a, a VP of product development? Do you want to be VP of marketing? 
you know, do you want to be a venture capitalist? Each of us have got a certain role that we want to play. Then next step it comes down to is what actions do you need to take now? Not what you took yesterday, not what you took when the company is started, what needs to be done right now? Where are you riding on your past glory? Especially for us who are in a job for some time, that's an extremely important motivation to look at because we become lethargic at some level. We begin to do the same thing over and over expecting different results, even though that's a clinical definition of insanity. So, at some level, our actions become more of activities. In each of our jobs, each of our roles, we need to start challenging things and say, what action can I take tomorrow that I haven't taken? You know, like what kind of things I have not engaged with in past one year? I tell people, every six months to a year, you have to take one activity that you normally don't take up. So, maybe scuba diving, maybe parachute jumping, or maybe just going and running a marathon, or maybe doing something that is funny, playing in a, in a drama, singing in a contest, writing a story, taking an art class, learning sign language, pick up something. Every six months to a year, do something you would not do otherwise. Those actions will rewire your brain. You know, the, you know it is not about, see, our intelligence is not dependent on how many neurons do you have. But how many new connections are you making with those a same set of neurons? And interestingly, whatever patterns you see, how much ever intelligence you have, if your body is not involved in making new connections, whatever you have is old knowledge. Your awareness will increase, your capability will increase if you can actually engage in an activity which allows you to make new connections with your brain. And the last one, out of all this, gain perspective. If I were to be CEO of this company, what would I be aspiring? If I were to be actually the president of this country, what would I aspire? You know, like, uh, there is a young group of people who came to the conference which I organized about a couple of months ago, Igniting the Genius. All these kids who are like, anywhere from 8 or 10 to 16, they were all part of what Abdul Kalam, uh, President Abdul Kalam created as a LEAD 2020 project. They went through a three day or a five day workshop and they came here and they were given one minute to say where do they want to be. A gentleman whose hand somebody held to bring to this microphone and then we find out I want to be the first visually challenged President of India. I had tears in my eyes. He is 13 years or 14 years old and this kid is aspiring to be a president of India. And there was a young girl, 10 years old, she comes in and says, I want to be not only the best dancer in my field, I want to be the best administrative officer. Okay? And interestingly, it is not like they are just saying something that would be nice. When we were having dinner, this kid comes to me and says, you spoke about this conference. I didn't understand some of the details of it. But what I liked was, you spoke and you did A, B, C. How did you get to be that way? How can I speak like what you did? What are some, some of your, what you call key tips, if I want to speak like this? If I want to be an administrative officer, I should be able to communicate very effectively. Now I found you, you can do effectively. I thought she just wanted a superficial answer. No. She kept going deeper. Next question. Next question. And, and then she goes and says, you know, I don't have an email ID. Actually, I don't have a computer. But I want your card. I want your email ID. And I want you to remember me. You know, this is my name. And I am the person who said this one. One of these days I am going to send you an email. I want you to reply to me because I need your help. What was amazing was this young girl who is not even out of, you know, not even a teenager probably, she had not just a courage, she had a conviction, she had a perspective and she is looking for a pathway. 
our, our perspective, our actions, the role, the decision making or discrimination and our persistence and our motivation are all right. My sense is we look at motivation as first level motivation which is mostly superficial, which is needed. Until we go through that motivation, we may never get to it. But at that time, we stop asking questions. We become very satisfied with what we got. I am recommending, if you want to become global leaders, if you want to become extraordinary human beings who can achieve your true not in an emotionally intelligent way, I recommend, don't stop at the first problem. Don't stop at the second problem. Don't stop at the third problem. Begin to look at it and say, how do I reframe this problem? Whom do I need to get help? How do I actually approach this? What is it that I am doing that I am hitting against the wall again and again and again? Who will give me a perspective? How do I actually take a different action that would get me a different kind of intelligence than that I have done? That probably less than 1% of people do. But those are the people who actually bring inspiration and magic and show us all what we can be and who we can be if we truly ignite our genius to the fullest extent. Does it answer your question? Uh, sometimes when you actually reach the true north, uh, you lose the north. You find a new north from that So how is that transition uh, goes on and uh, how should one The true north has something to do with your authenticity. That is number one. The second thing is, there are three parts which you need to know for true north. One is, it gives you direction when you are lost. It challenges you when you are smug. It inspires you when you are depressed. Anything that inspires you when you are truly down, when you think about it. Anything that gives you direction when you are totally lost. Anything that warns you, uh oh, you are becoming arrogant. That is connected with your true now. It will keep changing. Ultimately, you will notice among various goals that you have, when I want to be, when I am 30, this is where I want to be, when I am 40, or when I am 60, or what I want to tell my grandkids, all of them will keep changing. Just like you said earlier, we don't know what we don't know till we experience it or till we come to know of it through any other perception or experience. But the moment you stop, like you know, when Gretzky is quoted to have said, 100% of the shots I don't take, Never make it to the goal. It's a simple thing. Whatever I stop attempting, whatever I let my fear stop me, whatever I let my old experience stop me, you might have failed 20 times. But 21st time you may be about to win. But if you give up, you are a loser. You know, this happens a lot in Las Vegas. You know, like many times in slot machines, people keep on putting some coins. They keep on trying. Obviously, the house is always going to win majority of the time. I know all these people who actually kind of uh, give money and drinks, they keep watching. Especially after you get frustrated. After not getting, you know, let us say you lost $20 or $30 or $50, but you didn't get anything, you go away. They know there is a jackpot waiting to happen. There is a big payout waiting to happen. They just come in and put one quarter or two quarters or three quarters and they get a big money. Then you beat yourself up. I choose. I should have actually stayed with it. Have you ever noticed many times right after we give up is when the payout comes and we are the one who lost out? In life, it doesn't depend upon how many try, tries you have made. It only depends are you still in the game? Are you still trying? Or have you given up? The moment we have given up, only thing we have given up is our ability to be a leader. Our ability to get what we want. The rest of it will be fine. There will be nothing wrong. Everything will be fine. Except that you have given up your right to get to where you want to get to. But one thing which is very interesting is, in this journey, you can take up exactly where you left out. As long as you don't have scar tissue. 
But sometimes we take our old experiences and old failures, make it into a drama. We create a story around it and we become a victim. That is what is called learned helplessness. We need to let go of the failures. Learn from your failures. Let go of the failures and move on with whatever you have learned. Keep trying. Because great leaders don't achieve success not when you are just doing something. You know, there is a story. A gentleman, a Orissa secretary, additional secretary, I was doing some non-profit work with the Bhagavatula Charitable Trust. I was coming from a place called Haripuram and then into Visakhapatnam. It was like really bumpy set of roads and all of them. And then there was a gentleman who was a secretary before and he was sitting in and he was talking to me. I was like sleeping and waking up, sleeping because the whole day I spent in the village and suddenly something attracted my attention. What he was saying was there was a priest who came in from United States. He was some you know, Christian evangelical person who came in and it seems he worked with some Orissa, Oriya, Adivasis or some of them and he was sent there to convert into Christianity. So he went, he became part of them, he spent one year, he spent two years, he had zero conversions. So when he called the church, they said, okay, this is not the place where you are connecting, this is the place where you are ineffective, you should get out of there. But he didn't. He said, you know, I like the people. You think I am not connecting. You know, I really feel close to these people. Please give me one more year. He stayed back for one more year. Then they said, your three years, your you know, mission is over. Why don't you just come back? He said, no, I am going to stay there. They said, I am sorry, we are going to get you out of the system. We are going to fire you from this role. He said, fine, I want to stay in this. He decided to stay there for about eight years or nine years. And the only way he got out was, he got one of the malaria or some such disease and he died after about 9 years there. He was in his late 20s or early 30s when he passed away it seems. And what was amazing he said was, because he was a foreigner, he was there and the secretary happened to be there. He went to the memorial service, there were 8000 people who came to the funeral and he said in the next 3 months, Several thousand of them converted into Christianity. He never saw a single person got converted into Christianity. And then this gentleman got curious because he thought, you know, you know that this worry about all these people coming and converting them into religion and we have a lot of religious stuff. So he went to inquire into what happened. They said, everybody talks about God, everybody talks about Christ, everybody talks about Allah. What this person did is he gave his life so that we could have a better life. He didn't talk about Christ. Actually, after the first three years, he stopped converting because he doesn't have a pressure to convert anybody. He just lived one among us. He's helped us in every way. He taught us wherever there was literacy. He gave us tools. He became one. And because of that, we are inspired. If this is if Christ is whom he believed, that allowed him to live the life that way, we all want to be Christians. So to a certain extent, reaching your true north, you may never know. But in the process of it, if you are willing to surrender yourself, it's a big word, especially for younger generation. But to the extent we can let go of our intellectual angst, in trying to get there and go in there in a kind of a way where that is your destiny because you are already beginning from that place you see there is no place to go to it's only a state of the mind when you can do whatever you do with a certain sense of conviction certain sense of authenticity certain sense of commitment certain sense of uh, opportunity and certain sense of contribution or you can even take it into the four things which I started out with. Whatever you do, do it with a sense of joy and happiness. Do it bringing all your skills and competence, competencies, doing the best job you can. And bringing whatever you got as a service. Not as something you receive, but as something you are just giving, not expecting anything back. And four. Look at it like whatever you are doing is meeting your needs. 
If you can do that, and if the right hand column balances it out from the other people's perspective, chances are you are not reaching the true now. You are living your true now. At that time, we can say we have lived a fulfilling life. To a certain extent, that is something that gets missing. When we become very busy, we become caught up with the job. Nothing wrong with it. We have to do the job to the fullest extent. But do it with a certain sense of joy, certain sense of commitment, certain sense of service, certain sense of uh, meeting the needs to the fullest extent. I have a feeling wherever we go, doors will open. Where there were no doors before, people will call you and ask you to join their jobs and their companies. Why? Because what you bring is something that is missing in 90% of the people. They may have degrees, they may have qualifications, they may have age, they may have looks, they may have anything else. But the sense of contribution to the fullest extent, when you bring, you are a global leader, no matter which country you go, what role you take, you will raise to the top. That's what I am saying. Last question. So you said, uh, work on your, what is it that you are procrastinating? If that is something you can work on and make it work, then you move to your know, next level. Now, the uh, point is, how do you distinguish? Probably that is something which really you didn't want to get there at all. That's why you are procrastinating. So, Excellent point. There are questionings. Wherever you are procrastinating, there you can get a big payoff. Reason why we procrastinate is because there is something that is stopping us. How do we deal with that? Interestingly, where we procrastinate, where we actually are unable to see, that is because the mindset with which we are approaching is not necessarily working. We look at it as something that doesn't work, something we don't have confidence, or something in which we failed before, or something we feel it is too big a project. You know, there is an example of you know, Arno Penzias, who is a Nobel laureate, who used to be the head of Bell Labs uh, quite some time ago. He wrote a book called Ideas and Information. I had a chance to at one time talk to him. He gave an example. He wrote about it quite a bit in the book, in case you want to look at He talked about a Swedish architect who got a large number of patents in Bell Telephone Labs. He came out of architecture, not even computer science, not communication science. It seems that gentleman gave an example saying, when he passed out, he was one of the top architects. He got to a job and it was in a, some kind of a stock home, a rich community, a gated community. And the boss said, oh, you are the hot shot we have been waiting for. I heard you are so good in architecture. You come from this school. Okay, here is the project. There are 200 acres, 80 houses need to be built, okay? And you have total freedom. You can do anything you want. These are like million dollar houses. We decided you are the right person to get up this project manager. This guy completely froze. He might have gotten a top rank, but till now what he did is, a, you know, projects which are in the school. Suddenly, he is being given a real project, multi-million dollar project. He completely froze. The boss came in after about one week. He realized where the, this guy is. He said, you know, in Sweden we have so much of snow. Why don't you build it in such a way? The houses and the garage are right next to the street. So that means you can come in. You don't have to, what you call, snow blow the entire driveway. You know, it becomes faster. And it becomes a lot easier. So just put the house and the garage right next to the, the street so that they can do it. He said, oh, that looks like an interesting idea. I'll take that as a kernel. He started designing and very quickly he found out if you put houses right next to this, and these are all like multi-acre houses, if you put them, first of all, number one, everybody comes on the street. They have to stop and make a 90 degree turns into the garage. Okay? Now, the whole traffic becomes jammed up. Next, when they need to get out of the garage, it is true that the street uh, cleaners will clean the garage, will clean the street, except that when they clean the street, all that 
snow will pile up in front of the garage. That's number one. You will reduce your visibility. Number two, when you open the garage and try to back up, you have to back into a flowing traffic. That actually will take a lot of time to get in and it actually the whole, you know, your multi-millionaire type of stuff, to have that type of a thing doesn't look very good. So he decided the boss is stupid, his idea is terrible, so I'm going to design it in a different way. So he went ahead and put it in a bag and he created something else and then he got stuck in another place. So he didn't know what to do. When boss said, how is everything going? He said, fine, fine. But the boss realized, realized that this guy is stuck. So what he did is, he came back and said, you know, another thing. In, in Sweden, we only come back from work and we don't go in the weekdays, in the evening to do shopping and all that. So we do all the shopping and we can come in. So why not you put, as soon as the car stops, right next to the garage, put the kitchen so that we can bring all the stuff which we brought in put it in the kitchen. So this guy thought, oh this is like a great idea. We started designing and then he realized we go with the snowshoes. Nobody likes to walking into the kitchen where you eat and the, you know, they may not be Indian housewives or Indian uh, husbands, but nobody likes all this dust and mud and snow to come directly into the kitchen. So this, he decided this doesn't work. First he created an ante room, then he created a shoe room, then he created something else. such suggestions, he realized what boss is doing is not giving stupid suggestions because he doesn't know. He is giving stupid suggestions just to get this guy off his stuckness. When he can see that the boss's suggestions don't work, you feel smarter, you feel more intelligent, you will bring out more of your genius to play, especially when you see somebody who is not good enough. Interestingly, he realized the way to coach, the way to mentor, the way to help people to when they are stuck is not by criticizing, not by poking fun, not by needling them, but by creating a pathway, an alternate pathway in which they are not stuck. See, mind is a very interesting thing. Whatever patterns you do not follow, will actually drop off. The myelin sheath on those uh, neural, neuronal connections will drop off. Whatever new patterns and new connections you have made, those will become the ones that mind will recall first. It is just like a path. You know, when you are going from here to your uh, student housing, if you go on the grass, if all of you walk on a path, suddenly the grass will die and you will create a path. Now there is a new student village comes in, and you stop using this particular path, you come from another path. What happens to the old path? The grass grows, other path grows. Mind works exactly that way. So the way to deal with wherever you are stuck is not focusing on where you are stuck, but focusing on where you have still freedom to explore and think and do that. Just to complete this fellow's story, I was told that this fellow completed the entire design of the condominium or a housing complex in the shortest possible time, while he thought he was actually bumbling along his way, the boss knows because he trusted the genius of this kid more than the kid trusted in himself. So, this is a collaborative process, it's a co leader process. If when you are in teams with other people, whether it's a work team or a student team or something else, whether you like them or not, if you can figure out a way to add value to somebody, especially where they need help, not laughing at them, making fun of them or doing something, if you can genuinely, authentically help them to get off their stuckness, that is the greatest gift you can give. Why? Because that is where most of our energy gets lost. We try to pretend like we don't have any stuckness, we try to hide it behind our efficiency instead of dealing with all the stuckness that we have. It is like this. If you have air conditioning to this one and you are cooling down because outside is 40 degrees but you left the door open. If, out, if this is exposed to let us say outside, it doesn't matter how much you crank up the air conditioning here. Till you close the door, the temperature doesn't cool here. right? Just like that. 
that stuckness we have is like the doors that are left open. We can keep doing micro adjustments in the temperature and working with where we have, but till we learn to recognize where is that we are getting the cold air, you know, or behind is completely open, the emperor is, has no clothes. When we recognize and work with it, with the help of somebody else, because other people see our back, we don't see it. But mostly, when we see somebody with a bare back, what do we do? Kick them. But instead of that, if you can serve them, when they most vulnerable are, that creates the foundation for deeper friendship. Deeper friendship. That is what I mean by bringing joy to others. That's what I mean by using your skills in a way that can serve the emotionally intelligent skills. That is where you can serve them, where they didn't even know they needed service. Meeting the needs when they didn't even know they have certain needs. Majority of us, in the area of emotional intelligence, in the area of spiritual intelligence, we are all infants. Our intelligence in the IQ domain is extremely high. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting in this room. We will, be, we will not be working in or studying in this institution. Our IQs, there are no questions. Can we use the IQs to develop the EQs and also our SQs to some extent? To the extent we can do, we can create an extraordinarily powerful leadership field where it is no longer about a one or two or three people doing very well when they get out of this institution. So you will see the entire batches of students doing extraordinarily well. Why? Have you seen? Like IIT is going through 50th, IIT Madras is going through 50th anniversary. This weekend, I, I mean IISC is celebrating its centenary. If you look at some of the things, you notice some batches of students, there are so many achievers. Why? Because suddenly they created a field in which they are able to help each other. I hope your batch is one of them, where you will get to a place 20 years from now, there are so many high achievers, there are so many remarkable human beings who have turned into leadership that we can reflect back and say, oh, that's an interesting time. GPS was not available. So we used to start off from the port and all the ships used to head in the same direction. But we were always taught to set our course with the help of stars. And we, despite the storms, despite the currents, we reached our destination. Similarly at ISB, we soon will be leaving and we seem to be heading in the same direction. But I hope with your advice we will be able to find our true north and find our destination. Thank you. And, uh, uh, we are also running a small competition where we are asking you to define what leadership means to you. I think today's lecture will help us put those things in 250 words and it will also help to synthesize what we learned today. And if it is a good entry, you might even win an iPod. So, there is an incentive for writing and Prasad will be the one who will be judging the best entry. Along with us. Along with us. So, we have time till Monday. We will look forward to see more entries coming. Thank you. Thank you.